If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 5. We're in a series called Salt and Light. Anybody enjoying Salt and Light? Anybody? Two people. Excellent. Super responsive crowd today. I cannot wait. It's going to be so fun today. I can't wait. So Matthew 5, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, and when he's, he's talking to us about being salt and light, basically, hey, God's going to do a, a powerful work on the inside of you so he can do one through you. Here's what Jesus says. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. No, we're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. And if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. And now that you're here on this hilltop or on this light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God this generous father in heaven. And so we said last week and really both weeks, salt and light is just a reminder that yes, God desires to do a powerful transforming work in your life. And yes, he loves you and wants to be in relationship with you. But also just the mission of God in the heart of God is for those who are not yet here. It's the Jesus leaving the 99 for the one. It's it's his mission to coming to seek and save that which is lost. And he commissions his church to be salt and light, to bring people into the fold. And, uh, and so in Luke 19, 10, it's kind of a theme verse for us, but it says the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Familiar passage, familiar, a familiar verse, and we've talked about it for the last couple weeks, but this verse actually comes on the back end of a story uh, where Jesus is meeting this unlikely dinner party guest. And so last week we talked about One of the ways that we can reach our friends and family, people who are far from God, one of the ways that we can serve the lost is to just join God where he's already at work. This week, I want to talk about this idea of reaching friends and family, helping helping, uh, the lost be found by way of the table. So just food. Who's excited now? Let's go. So here we go. Luke 19, uh, starting with verse 1 and going to about verse 10. It says this, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and a man there, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was so short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. Verse 5 and 6, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, what is wrong with you? No, he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people. Everybody say, all the people. Not some, not a few. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he is gone to be the guest of a sinner. Even the people who are pro Jesus, even his team, all the people. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord. Here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay it back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. For the son of man, there it is, came to seek and save the lost. How many of you, how many of you grew up in uh, Sunday school? Come on, let's date ourselves. OG fam, wow. Okay, cool. Excellent. Excellent. How many of y'all know the song? Zacchaeus was a weed. How many of you could sing it? You could sing it? How many of you want to come up here and sing it? Anybody want to come up here and sing it? No one? Cool. Hey, come on, right here. You're the only one that's all day. Come on, hit me with it. Zacchaeus was a wee little boy, and a wee little boy was he. He climbed up in the It's got, so come on, y'all give it up. Y'all give it up, yeah. <laughs> Only one bold enough all day. Uh, and it sounds cute, like when we're singing it, and you know, you had the felt board back in the day or whatever. Like, it sounds cute when you're singing the song, but uh, it's not that Jesus loves short kings. That's not what this passage is about. This, this verse seven tells us that the encounter that Jesus has with Zacchaeus catches everybody off guard. All the people were weirded out 
that Jesus went to dinner, went to, went to the house of this sinner. And so why, why is that? So Zacchaeus was a tax collector, which for me and you, is, is, things are lost on us. And so even if you know, you may not know to the degree that this is, this is a big deal. So he's a Jew who sold out fellow Jews to collect taxes from Rome. He is a Hebrew by birth, and yet he, um, he kind of sold his people out. So the way that it works is that uh, Rome would hire someone, and, and then Rome would get their cut, and you could get your cut. And sometimes you determine what your cut is, and you have the backing of the Rome military to make sure that Rome gets their cut, because Rome's about them taxes. And so uh, Zacchaeus, this is who he is. And it's not just a tax collector. He's the chief of tax collectors, which means he, he's, over, he's over a region. You know, he, he's over a squad. And so... Uh, it's a really big deal. In the culture of the first century Jew, the two lowest rungs on the moral ladder were tax collectors and sex workers, prostitutes. And so who does G Jesus eat with more than once in the Gospels? Tax collectors, prostitutes. And so for us in the room today, uh, that, that model makes Jesus very attractive. The fact that Jesus targets the marginalized, those who are on the outside, those who are broken, because we're the beneficiaries of context. We've got a couple thousand years removed from this. But if you'd have been a peer of Jesus, a contemporary of Jesus, you would have been really weirded out that he chose to engage Zacchaeus. And so for most of the people who are here, they do not think this is a good idea. We don't have tax collectors anymore, so it's kind of hard for us to imagine. I mean, we have the IRS, but it's like not the same as what we're talking about in this passage. And we do have sex workers, and yet... We, have, we live in such a sex-saturated culture that a lot of us are just numb to that, and even people that we know that would joke about it. Um, and so it's kind of hard for us to even mentally go where they were, but, I, but it just this exercise would be helpful. Think about the most immoral person that you know, or maybe the most immoral person that you don't personally know, you just know they're wicked. And and so maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's someone that uh, you went to school with, maybe somebody you're just like, man, they are just like, their heart is trash. Like they do not like people. And, uh, and again, just get in your mind's eye, like who's the most immoral person that I can think of? Now imagine Jesus invites himself over to dinner at their house. He's breaking bread, sharing stories, pouring wine kind of reclined in his chair, and you're going, what, what, that person? And so that's the, that's the equivalent. And so, like, feelings of anger, confusion. If you're a follower of his, you're like, is this where we're going? This is weird. And, and so all that sets in. And um, for Jesus, the table is a really important place to do ministry, and it's a really important place for evangelism. So yes, we can join God where he's already at work in that, hey, the first time that you have a conversation with friend or family, somebody who's far from God, uh, that's not the first time that God's at work in that individual's life. He's been after them from day one. And yet also one of the places that we can kind of break down barriers, one of the places that we can really do a lot more than just in a gathering like this is around the table. So meals in the, the first century, in the ancient Near East, they mean even more than they do today. And meals are great today. So if we get together with loved ones around the holidays, what do we do? We eat. That's what we do. If it's somebody's birthday party, what are we going to do? Okay, cool. Let's eat. And, you know, it's just any, any kind of, you know, major social moment is attached to food in some way. And yet now it's just easier for us than ever before to just, like, run in, grab something real quick. Hey, I ain't got time to, like, hang I just want to hit that Chick-fil-A window in Jesus' name. You know what I'm talking about? And so, but back in the day, meals were a big deal. Meals were boundary markers. And they showed really who was in and who was out. They still do. And so a couple things about eating together. Uh, meals were meant to bring people together. And so if you take the word companion for, as an example, and you break it down like in the Latin, uh, calm is with and pan is the word for bread. So someone that you're, over, you're eating bread with is your companion. So meals were meant to bring people together, but also meals are meant to keep people apart. 
And, and we know this because um, there's an exclusivity attached to, to dinner parties or special moments or, hey, did you get the invite? Are you going to the wedding? Are you going to the birthday or whatever? And even more deep, kind of more, more broadly than that, in the pre-civil rights South, there was the no black sign over the door. Or in Nazi Germany, pre-outbreak of World War II, signs on the country club or restaurant, no Jews or dogs. And today, segregation still exists, but a lot of times by way of class. So the more affluent eat at a certain type of restaurant. Middle class, apparently all the middle class eats at Texas Roadhouse. I don't know, I don't understand what Texas Roadhouse laces their steaks with, but everybody in Hickory eats at Texas Roadhouse. Somebody help me. Middle, blue, blue collar eats a blue collar. And it always feels weird when you mix it up. Like if you know kind of where you're at, and you've ever stepped either up or down into like a different kind of social space, cultural space to go and eat with a different group of people that's a little more bougie, a little less bougie, that kind of thing. Like it always feels weird when you go into the, I've had that moment where you walk in, you go, ooh, these, this isn't me. Yep, this is, this is you, right? So, but if you're faking it, you know, you're like, what fork do I use? Like, you, you know, you're, and, or, or, or the opposite is true, where you find yourself really uncomfortable at that little sandwich shop in that corner, you know, in the hood. Like, it's so, so you don't know what to do whenever we cross those lines. And for Jesus, meals are all about breaking down barriers. This is what he's doing with Zacchaeus. And it wasn't like Zacchaeus had just offended somebody by saying something stupid or doing something dumb that one time. Everybody hated him and what he stood for. And Jesus, by inviting himself over to Zacchaeus' house, by breaking bread with him, by sharing a meal with him. He's this first century rabbi who's literally, he's just teaching people God's law. This is like a social faux pas. You don't hang out with this guy. And he's implicitly telling everybody, hey, Zacchaeus is with me. That's what he's saying in this passage. And so Jesus gets himself killed in part because of the way that he ate. It's for Jesus, meals weren't a boundary marker, like to keep certain, a type of person away. It was a welcome to the kingdom. It was, come here, have a seat next to me, Zacchaeus. And at the end of uh, the story in verse 9 and 10, Jesus says this about Zacchaeus. Today, salvation has come to this house. What does he mean when he says salvation? It means here's a guy who's far from God. Here's a guy who's far from the people of God. Here's a guy, when was the last time Zacchaeus broke bread with other believers? When was the last time Zacchaeus, did he, he, did he hold an orthodoxy? Probably. Did he believe in God? Probably. Did he? And yet he couldn't get in. And, and so Jesus says, hey, here's this guy who's just far from God. And then comes to, the Bible tells us, comes to a place of repentance. Because he looks at Jesus and says, hey, I'll give away half of what I have. I know how I got where I got. And if I owe anybody anything, four times what I owe them. That's how you know, that's real repentance right there when you're willing to let go of the coin. And so he, he says, hey, I'm, 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 I'm all in. I want to follow you. And so that's real salvation. But then it says this in 9 and 10, Jesus reminds us, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is a familiar phrase that shows up multiple times in the Gospels. Just in Luke's Gospel alone, for example, if you go to Luke chapter 7, same phrase shows up. Different moment, again, back to food, where food's in the mix. We're at the table, and here's what happens. Jesus says to this group that's with him, so there's a, there's a legal scholar, there's a Pharisee, invited him to this dinner party. And, uh, and Jesus, here's, here's the scene. He says, John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say that John has a demon, the son of man came eating and drinking, and you say, here's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom is proved right by all her children. In other words, the proof is in the pudding. So look at John's fruit. Look at my fruit. You're getting, you're getting caught up in things that, that don't matter. And when the Bible tells us, because it does multiple times, that Jesus was a drunkard and a glutton, I don't really think that Jesus was either of those things, and yet he continually finds himself at the table and so while they're having this conversation, in walks this woman. And she, uh, she was a sex worker. She was a prostitute who comes in with this alabaster jar, this perfume 
It's, it's super expensive, about a year and a half's worth of wages. She walks in, she comes, she's crying. She comes to the feet of Jesus, and she begins to worship Jesus and begins to clean his feet. No one has done this so far. And so she pours the entire bottle. On, it was already weird. Now I got real weird. And, and, and the entire bottle on Jesus' feet, crying, tears are washing his feet, takes her hair down and begins to dry his hair and wash his hair with or wash his feet with her hair, and then she begins to kiss his feet. And it, it makes everyone uncomfortable. It would be uncomfortable today, can we be real for a minute, if this took place, even more so for, for this group of people. And so legal scholars and Pharisees are people who are really kind of impressed with Jesus' knowledge of God's word and just kind of invited him here to, to kind of poke at, prod, ask questions, better understand. They're totally blown away. They're like, this cannot be a prophet. If he was a prophet, he would he would not allow for this to happen. He would know who it is that's washing his feet. And here's what Jesus says in response. Verse 40 of Luke 7. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. That's right. That's a, big, that's a big debt. And then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Would have been a snub for Jesus, for someone as affluent as a Pharisee, to have access to a basin of water and, again, cultural practice to wash the feet of guests that you have, especially at a dinner party. And Jesus never gets that. He says, hey, you didn't wash my feet, but, but look at how she is. He says, you did not give me a kiss. Again, cultural moment as well. Come in greeted with a kiss. But this woman, from the entire time I've entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And then the other guests begin to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. But the part of the passage that gets me is where it says, whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. And it just, it makes me think, when I'm thinking about hospitality and I'm thinking about evangelism and I'm thinking about the lost being found, for so many of us, we've just forgotten that we were lost. We have just forgotten to what degree, like how far gone we were. And I'm not saying that, you know, uh, you did something that people knew about. I'm just saying deep down, if you were being honest, your motivations, your heart, your selfishness, your sin, your own brokenness, if you really stop and take inventory of what Christ has done for you, you go, man, I need, I need that like she needs that. I'm not 50 denarii in debt. I'm 5,000 denarii in debt. And thank God for Jesus and his faithfulness in my life, which is why Jesus addresses it. Hey, the difference between her and you, Simon, is she knows she's a sinner, and you pretend you're not. And so the hospitality is there for Zacchaeus. The hospitality is there for her in this moment. All of this is taking place around a table. And for Jesus, a lot of his ministry takes place in a space like this, not in a synagogue, not in a temple, a lot of it around a table. I'm just going to hang out in Luke's gospel. Luke's gospel only. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners at the home of Levi. This is the calling of Matthew. In Luke 7, Jesus is, anointing in the home of si is anointed in the home of Simon the Pharisee during a meal. Just read it. In Luke 9, Jesus feeds the, the 5,000. In Luke 10, Jesus eats in the home of Martha and Mary. In Luke 11, Jesus condemns the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. At a meal. In Luke 14, Jesus is at a meal when he urges people to invite the poor to their meals rather than their friends. In Luke 19, Jesus invites himself to, to dinner with Zacchaeus. In Luke 22, we have the account of the Last Supper. And in Luke 24, after he's risen, post-resurrection, 
Jesus shows up with these two disciples on the road to Emmaus and breaks bread with them. And then later eats fish with the disciples in Jerusalem. Jesus likes to eat, fam. Okay? So that's what I'm trying to say. One scholar said this about Jesus. In the Gospels, Jesus is either coming from a meal, at a meal, or heading to a meal. And some of us are following Jesus a little too close in this area. Come on. Right? Another biblical scholar said, if you can read the New Testament and not get hungry, you are not paying attention. It's like watching that cooking class, that cooking channel. It's like watching that YouTube cooking channel or Food Network or whatever, and all of a sudden, you're hungry. You weren't hungry before, but now you are. It's the New Testament. When Jesus was calling people to gather around a meal, he wasn't just eating and drinking for the sake of eating and drinking. He was building something. He was building kingdom. So he's like, tax collector, get in here. Sex worker, get in here. The religious elite, the marginalized, the sick, the poor. And he's tearing down walls. He said, hey, this looks like the... Bu-. Y'all remember high school cafeteria back in the day? Some of y'all are in there right now. High school cafeteria is sometimes the most segregated place in all of high schools. Like, everybody kind of hanging out with their own little clique. Jesus comes in. He's like, oh, no. We're about to mix it up. Band, get in here. Jocks, get in here. Nerds, get in here. Like, we're all going to sit at the same table. And so when the early church formed in the book of Acts, it said that the church gathered in spaces like this. But it also said that the church gathered house-to-house ministry around a table like Jesus is modeling with Zacchaeus and like this woman, eating, drinking, remembering Jesus, helping one another and, and praying for one another. Building uncommon unity centered on the person of Jesus sounds very familiar. And, and earlier today, we took the time to share in communion. I think it's really important for us as a church family to do that broadly like across locations and spaces and services and all that. Let's do it all together to remember the body that was broken for us and the blood that was shed for us. But it didn't start off with like Welch's and a little wafer. You know what I'm talking about? A little stale wafer. That's not how it started. It started with a meal. It started with the love feast. When Jesus is instituting the Last Supper, it is at Passover. They're eating a meal. It's not like he got everybody together and said, I got this one bottle of cab and I got this bread and we're just going to do this extra. No, they were eating a meal. They were, they were eating a meal. And so he says, Hey, what would, what would hit? I believe for you even harder is if you actually remember the body that was broken for you, the blood that was shed for you, as you get together around a dining room table in someone's home meal out, like you, we need to break bread together. It reminds me of grandma's house growing up on Sundays I had a granny. Anybody have a granny? Shout out to the grannies. And so uh, we go over to granny's house, cousins, aunts, uncles, everybody, post-church, and she would throw down, you know, and everybody would bring a little bit of something. And then, but we'd always, we'd also have people who came that we didn't, we're like, we're not related to these people. We don't even know where these people came from. And they would just come to granny's for lunch. If you had the same granny, you know what I'm talking about. And you have more people than you do seats and you're doing the math. I don't know how we're all going to fit in her little house to do this thing, and yet there was always enough food, and there was always enough room, and this is the table of Jesus, and this is what I'm talking about. When I think about the table, when I think about biblical hospitality, when I think about the Lord's table, this is what I think about. And so the idea is that eating a meal together, for Jesus, it's not a sign of the kingdom. It is the kingdom. When you and I gather in the name of Jesus, break bread together, Talk about life, faith, who we are in Christ, and invite other people into that space. Regardless of what you look like, where you came from, how much money you have, who your mom and daddy are, what, what, uh, any of the socioeconomic things that hold us back, any of the political things that hold us back, hello, I'm not going to dig in, calm down, any, any, like, uh, but any of the things that normally kind of tribalize us, Jesus has a way of humbling all that. And in the Gospel of Luke, the writer uses this formula. It's really cool where the, Luke says the Son of Man came, and then he fills in the blank. So a couple things. He shows us the mission and the method of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Luke 19.10, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is the mission of Jesus. And then he tells us how. Luke 7.34, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. That is how. One person at a time, one meal at a time, one invitation at a time. 
one really, I can't, I can't, I would love to be in the mix. I would love to go back and be able to just be in the room at Jesus's table. How weird it must have been for everybody. <laughs> and awesome. Like, look at this, a weird group of people all hanging out together. And so this is how Jesus ushers in all sorts of people into the kingdom over the table. And this is what he's calling us as followers to do, one person at a time, one meal at a time. If you look at kind of the model of Jesus and, and sharing the good news of who he is and this idea of evangelism, uh, there's a couple things. They're all, it's always kind of tailor-made for what people need. But there's a couple things I see in, in the Gospels. One, anytime he's with a group of people who kind of share some orthodoxy, belief in God, but maybe they've forgotten or they've drifted or they just need to be lovingly rebuked in some way, a lot of times he'll just preach broadly. So again, there's crowds of people and he'll just preach. But anytime there's someone who's like really broken and at the end of themselves, and it's just like never going to get invited to the synagogue, if you know what I'm saying. Jesus just creates and crafts a moment for this person. A lot of times over food. It doesn't have to be, but he always is really intentional to slow things down and meet people right where they are and love and serve people. So he would meet them um, right where they were and eat food and drink wine and hear their story and then invite them. This is a key ingredient. He would invite them into a relationship with him and he would say, hey, come and follow me. And they're thinking the whole time, you don't know who I am. And he's like, no, you don't know. I know you better than you know you. You're still invited. Okay? So, like, come and follow me. And a lot of times that's, we, we miss, if we just make it about food and drink, we're missing it. Like, when we're talking about biblical hospitality, it, it is about that. It is about service to one another. It is about the flavors and the sounds and the laughter. and it's like. But also it's about, like, who am I in Christ and sharing that with one another, even for people who aren't ready to hear it or necessarily share your convictions. Not to make them feel bad or judged or like, but just say, hey, I have no idea. I'm just telling you what Jesus has done in my life. You don't have to agree with me. We can eat, we can eat this burrito and, and like, and, but I'm just telling you this is what God's done in my life. And it'll change the game if we take this approach. Hospitality is how Jesus changes and transforms people in her book and you should read it and you should highlight it you should buy it read it highlight it all the things rosaria butterfield wrote a book called the gospel comes with a house key she and she tells her own personal story about like hospitality and, and so she says here's what jesus is doing through hospitality he's turning strangers into neighbors and neighbors into family when you just invite people in and the idea is to express the welcome of God to everyone through tangible acts of love, like a meal, care, relationship. So Jesus modeled it, and then we're commanded as followers of his all throughout the New Testament to, to follow him in this. I'll give you just three examples in the New Testament. Romans 12, 13. It says, practice hospitality. That's it. That's all it's got. You write that one down. That was real good. Here's another one. 1 Peter 4, 8 through 10. Above all... Love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Right after that, it says, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. I think that without grumbling is so key, and it messes me up. I hate that he threw that in there, to be honest with you. But it's, I struggle with that one. Can I be real for a minute? The hospitality, sometimes I'll hit my mark on hospitality, but the without grumbling piece just me, like I, I struggle with the grumbling piece because you get stressed out because you're thinking, my mindset's wrong with hospitality. I'm not thinking like Jesus. I'm thinking like Martha Stewart, you know what I'm saying? And I'm like, dang, I'm like, our house looks crazy. We don't have a, we don't even got a pumpkin candle yet. And look at them baseboards. Like you, like all of a sudden your spouse is like, we got to wipe down the baseboards. You ain't wiped down them baseboards in seven years. All of a sudden we got to wipe down baseboards because somebody's coming to dinner. Somebody mop. You're freaking out. Stuff's flying in the closet. You know, I don't know if it's just us, but it's like you're stressed out. Like we're, I don't know if hospitality is our gift because you're thinking in terms, you're thinking in terms of, man, it's got to be perfect. And, it's, and the sights and the sounds and the smells. You're thinking in terms of performance or entertainment. You're thinking about something different rather than just make room for people. Real hospitality is welcome to our house. We are slobs. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's real hospitality. This is us. Here we are. And so 
But this is not the way of Jesus. This is not what he does. And so uh, he goes on in 1 Peter 4, 8 through 10. He says, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in his various forms. So again, some of you think you're off the hook because you can't cook. Or you're like, I don't have a house. How about that? Ha ha ha. <laughs> Except Jesus, here's Jesus, son of man who doesn't have a place to lay his head. And yet he's hosting parties at somebody else's house. And so you can have the gift of hospitality wherever you go. Here's the gift of hospitality. Just make it about others. Hold the door. Say hello. Look at someone in their eyes. Don't be in too hurt. Like, listen to their story. If you can, sure, I'll buy your meal. Like, if you can't, then be like, we're just going to talk. We're going to drink coffee, you know, or whatever. Just, you can have hospitality. You don't have to have the things that you think you need. And here, here's Hebrews 3, 13, uh, 1 through 2. It says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. The writer of Hebrews throws that in there and just leaves us hanging. And he's just like, Selah. Like, that's all I got. Like, you're like, what? what? What does that mean? And he's like, he's just show hospitality to strangers. Wink. You know, like, that's it. And so all throughout the New Testament, we're told to live this out. And it matters to us only because it matters to Jesus. People are his passion. Generosity is his joy. Serving is his privilege. That's why those are our values. He models that and he calls us into that. But again, a lot of us are thinking about entertainment rather than Rather than real biblical hospitality, here's some distinctives between the two. Because and it's not that I think entertainment is bad. Let me just, as a caveat, because some of you are going to feel really bad about yourself. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's bad to get with a group of people that you have real chemistry with, same season of life, have same lived experiences, all that kind of stuff, share your convictions. I think that's great. Nothing wrong for that. That's different than what I'm talking about when I'm talking about break, making room at the table in biblical hospitality. So here's the difference. Entertainment's about exclusion. So you invite whoever it is that you want in that mix, and a lot of times it's the in crowd. It's about performance. Clear line between the host and the guest. Everyone is aware of who's, who's guest and who's host. Here's hospitality. It's about inclusion, service to others, and it blurs the line between host and guest. It's a dance where you go to that party and you're not even entirely sure <laughs> who... Who's doing what? Because it's, it's primarily about service to one another. Entertainment is sporadic. So it's a scheduled event on the calendar. And a lot of times there's reciprocity attached to it. So we'll invite them to this, so they'll invite us to that. Hey, if they don't invite us to the wedding, cut them off. We're going to cut them off. They didn't invite us to their... You know, like that's how we get sometimes. And so there's strings attached. It's about moving up the social ladder, one party invite at the time. Hospitality is a rhythm. And it's about gathering regularly. And it's generous. Grandma's house. It is not about getting anything in return. You know how many biscuits I cook for my grandma? Zero. None. And, cook, and, it, and, and she didn't care. She loved it. She loved serving. She loved giving. It's, it's just about, it's about being generous and, and, and uh, not really expecting anything in return. And it's not about moving up the social ladder. It's about justice for those who get no invite anywhere else. Zacchaeus hosts Jesus, who hosts Zacchaeus, because Jesus realizes no one is going, no one's going after Zacchaeus. No one's going after this girl who is pouring perfume on my feet. No one is after them. But he is after them. And then he invites us into the same ministry. Here's what Jesus says about the hospitality we should have. So some of you are like, okay, I'm sold on the idea of hospitality. Got it. Also, I feel a little bit bad about myself. Cool. Here's what Jesus says. And he's talking about a banquet. He's talking about the kingdom of God being, again, back to food. He's like, the kingdom of God's like a banquet, like a big feast. And then if you look in the book of Revelation, for example, it says that we as the church are the bride of Christ and we, co we go to this big wedding feast. I love our God. He just loves, loves him a good party. 
And it didn't start with Jesus. I'm going to chase this rabbit for a minute. Can I chase a rabbit for a minute? Is that cool? It didn't start with Jesus. In the Old Testament, the people of God had all kinds of festivals, all kinds of feasts. God from day one has been about gathering his people, celebrating who God is around bread. And so if you look at things like, man, the, the festival of the tabernacles, if you look at Passover, if you look at like the offering of first fruits, all of these are attached to like, let's get together, let's eat, let's celebrate God's goodness, God's faithfulness, and Jesus again as, as this Hebrew, born as a Hebrew, and born to fulfill the law as the Messiah, he just continues that tradition. And then he paints for us like a beautiful picture of what real hospitality looks like. He says this in Luke 14, 12 through 14. He says, Jesus said to his host, hey, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, man, don't just invite your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives, your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet... Invite the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, and then you'll be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And so for Jesus in the early church, they took something that in the ancient Near East, like dinner parties and like gathering around food. It was a real big deal outside of the Christian tradition and faith. But again, it was always about what somebody else could do for them, and it was always about reciprocity, and it was always about climbing the social ladder. And Jesus said, hey, what if we threw a party but for people who couldn't pay us back? What if we threw a party for people that weren't getting invited to anybody else's party? Matter of fact, the only way in this party is for you to realize that you really don't deserve to come to the party. That's how you know. And he says, that, that's what we want to create. Hospitality is about getting outside of our comfort zones and making it about others and serving those who don't look like you, think like you, different ethnicities, classes, lived experiences, education, politics. It's about breaking down barriers and getting to what matters most around the table, God and others. And so the idea that Jesus has and what he builds around his tables are multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multicultural family of God coming around the table, living as witnesses that the kingdom of God has come and is coming. This is the whole, this is the whole vision of our church. Uncommon unity just points to the fact that what if you could break bread, spend time with people, share life and faith with those who don't look like you weird everyone else out when they come into our church gatherings on Sunday and in your home around your table when they're like what is this it's so attractive historians argue that this is the primary way that the gospel s spread at such a rapid uh, pace in the early church so people are looking at the early church we always love we go back to the book of Acts how is it you have 120 people in the upper room on the day of Pentecost and then 300 years later this oppressed cult group that started off is now over half the population of the Roman Empire with no political influence, no protection. Thousands and tens of thousands, and like so many people have laid their lives down for the sake of the gospel. Martyrs for the faith have sown seeds so that you and I could have this moment right now. And it wasn't because they were trying to defend themselves. They literally just said, hey, you guys don't get it yet, but you will. And then 300 years, like that is wild. No internet, no sound systems, no YouTube. No, no marketing, no stages, just believers of Jesus gathering in homes and around tables in spaces like this one as well to make room for those who, who were new to that space. And so I just think about the, own, the, the, the powerful impact that the table has had in my own life. And uh, for Brooke and myself, we've... Um, the people that are at our church family right now that we have the most connection with, that we know the, their story, we know who they are, we call them on the birthday, things like that, are, are people that we've been in groups with, people that we've been around a table with. I think about Bill and June Starnes who co-led a group with us, and we got to know them better and got to be a part of their daughter's wedding. 
And we have this Christmas tradition with them because we got, because we shared space with them in community. I think, I think about you guys serving as intercessors for us because, because of that. I think about Bob and Sally Lee, who um, we were in group with, and we were selling our home. And in between selling our home and, like, closing on the new home, we really didn't have anywhere to stay. And so they were like, just come and live with us for, like, two and a half weeks. Bro, we got five kids. Come on. That's, and so we just would live with them. I think about, um, I think about all the people that we have a close relationship with because we've shared space, time around the table. We've been able to hear their testimony, what God's done in their life. And there's way more story. I could share way more stories about what God has done through others to impact me personally by way of groups, by way of biblical community. I don't have, if I'm being really honest with you, I want more stories of my impact on others. It was a few years ago where um, we had a friend, a guy who was a part of our church, and, and I would see him on the weekends, but outside of that, we didn't really, I, I didn't really see him that much. And he had gotten in a really hard place and um, was struggling to find work and had a bad accident. And, and anyway, he ended up with a stroke, was pretty much homeless, and when I found him and he was trying to navigate all this pretty much by himself because his family was remote. His family wasn't local. And so his relationship was church family. That was it. And um, I remember in that moment just the Holy Spirit speaking to me and be like, hey, this is for you. And so Brooke and I, we had just moved into a house and we told our oldest daughter, we're like, hey, can you move uh, out of your room? into a room with someone else so that this gentleman can come and just kind of have a place for a season while he's healing, while he's getting better. And so he lived with us for like six months over the holidays, dinners with family, just birthday party, like the whole thing. And, uh, and if I'm being real, like there were moments that I was like wrestling with the inconvenience, wrestling with the sacrifice, wrestling. And some of it's just perceived. I mean, some of it's just, I'm just selfish and God was <laughs> peeling that off right but at the at, if looking back on it, I'm going man I'm so like what God did in my heart through that I thought man I'm here helping this person and the whole time God's going this for you you need this as much as he does and so got to a place where got healthy and got his feet under him and was able to take next steps and move out and is doing well now. But I'm just thinking back on that season and going, I wish I had more stories like that. Like I don't have enough of those stories. Got a, got a couple token stories I could share with you. But if I'm being real, it's not like a lifestyle, like Jesus made it a lifestyle. And I believe what he's calling us to as a church family, if, if we're going to be salt and light, we just got to be available if we're going to be a salt and light, we just got to make room for people. And you're like, we don't got room. You got room. <laughs> and sometimes you just make room. Again, back to grandma's house. But it's just like, what? it's not that you, it's just, just keep in step with the spirit. What is God asking you to do for that coworker, for that friend, for that family member, for that person that you know? Just the Holy Spirit will tell you, hey, that's yours. Because some of us look around and we're like, somebody else will get that. And some people, nobody else is getting it. And so Jesus said, hey, would you model after me? Would you go after the Zacchaeus? Would you go after this woman? Would you go after these people? And uh, I believe God's just calling us to do that. So I just want to challenge you to make room in this season of your life. In your calendar, some of us, like, that's where you're afraid the most to let go of is just the calendar. I really don't want to invest in other people's lives for an hour and a half every other week. That's crazy. I'd rather, you know... Just make room for people in this season and break bread. Do life and faith over a meal and watch God work uh, in you as you do it. And uh, I believe that's what he's calling us to do as a community of believers. Some of you need to hear this too because you're here and you're hearing me talk about it. 
without really feeling invited yourself or feeling seen or feeling loved or feeling like you're even welcome in a space like this. And you need to know God loves you. God sees you. He is after you and he is inviting you. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of where you've been, he wants you.